In Star Sector, carriers offer an incredible amount of versatility and strength on account of their fighter bays being customizable based on your fleet's needs. Need more damage? Slap on some dagger bombers. Need defense against other fighters? Put some broadswords in the mix. Need protection against missiles? Well, this fleet of wasps would like to know your location. But before we get into all the differences between each fighter type, let's first cover each of the carriers in the game. For the sake of efficiency, we're only going to be looking at ships which primarily serve as carriers. This means we'll be excluding hybrid ships which have fighter bays added on as a supplement to their main weapons. This then leaves us with seven carrier ships in total that we can put in three categories. The starters, the midlines, and the chonkers. In the starter category, we have the first two carriers you're likely to see in the game. The Condor and the Colossus Mark III. The Condor is as close as you'll get to a pure carrier in the game, since it only has three weapon mounts with the most notable being its medium missile slot. And with its special ability being fast missile racks, you're likely going to slap on long range missiles that don't have an ammunition limit, such as salamanders or pylums. Due to its slow speed of 40 and its preference for long range missiles, the most natural role for the Condor is as a backline support ship since it won't be able to advance or retreat quickly enough in battle. In contrast to the Condor, which is almost exclusively a carrier, you have the Colossus Mark III. The Colossus Mark III is a bit of an oddball. While being cheaper to deploy compared to a Condor, it still has two fighter bays. And for weapons, it has a whopping 12 ballistic slots. You won't have much to work with for these though, since its flux dissipation is 180, and that's only slightly higher than that of a small frigate. Time to fire up the Vulcans, I suppose. Between the Condor and the Colossus Mark III, I'd say they both provide decent value, especially at the start of the game, but may struggle in later stages due to their slow speed, combined with their lack of firepower. Before we move on to the midline category though, I do think it's worth mentioning that the Colossus Mark III has a respectable 300 cargo capacity paired with a maximum crew of 160. So a couple of these in the early game might be enough for carting around resources and marines. Getting into more sophisticated midline carriers, we have the Drover first. For a 4 deployment point increase compared to the Condor, the Drover solves the Condor's speed problem and provides the B-deck ability for increased fighter spam. Personally, I'd say this is a worthwhile trade, because it's often the case that the Condor is so slow that it's outflanked by the enemy and quickly taken out. And the Drover has just enough speed to mostly solve this problem. While the Drover may not have a medium missile mount like the Condor, it has four small missile mounts, so I think that's a decent compromise. Oh, and if you thought the Condor looked like field goal posts, then we can confirm that a football theme is emerging for these carriers. The Drover straight up looks like a football stadium. The other midline carrier is the Heron, and it maintains a lot of the traits that make the Drover strong. Higher speeds and decent weapon slots. In exchange for the 20 deployment cost for the Heron, you also get three fighter bays with the targeting feed ability. At a first glance, it's easy to miss what the targeting feed ability does exactly, but essentially, as soon as the Heron activates this ability, its fighters are going to do extra damage, which can have a devastating effect on smaller ships who aren't able to keep up with the damage pressure. And another perk of the Heron is that it has a medium universal slot. This opens up a world of options for you as the player. You could put on a hypervelocity driver for extra shield pressure, you could put on a pylum, like what you would do with a condor for some missile spam, or you could invest in point defense. It's quite flexible. And then for the third carrier category, we have the Chonkers, the Mora, the Astral, and the Legion. Now I know what you're thinking, why is the Mora in this section if it's a cruiser sized ship and not a capital ship? Well take a look at its armor rating and you'll see exactly why. At a 1250 armor rating, the Mora has more armor than the Astral, having a slower speed and an, even a damper field further solidifies its chonker status. And it's not an exaggeration to say that the Mora is like a floating brick. Like the Heron, the Mora has three flight decks, but the Mora has the weapons edge having two medium missile mounts along with some ballistic slots. With the missile slots and the armor rating the Mora has, it makes it more effective as a frontline ship that can also comfortably fit in the back line. In my current playthrough, I've been using pylon missiles on the Mora, and it does a great job of keeping pressure on the enemy's front line. That all said, let's move into the capital ship category, where we have the Astral. Deploying this absolute unit comes with six fighter bays and two large missile slots to boot. This translates to a tremendous amount of pressure in the form of fighter spam, or bombing runs. The problem with the Astral though is you absolutely need to get value out of its weapons for it to be worth the 50 deployment point cost. Otherwise you'd be better off running two Herons or two Moras and getting the same number of fighter bays for fewer deployment points. And this generally speaking is the problem with high-tech ships. With them being so expensive it's very important for them to justify their cost 
or you'll be wasting your supplies and your deployment points. Keeping all these things in mind, you're going to want long range weapons on your Astral, as long of a range as you can get. For the medium slots, gravitons or ion beams are a good idea. For point defense, you can choose whichever you prefer, but I find myself running long range PD lasers or burst PD. And last but certainly not least, you're probably going to want squall missiles on the large missile slots. I could see Mervs or Locusts working here too, but using the Astral for shield pressure feels the best in my opinion since confirming kills can be left up to your front line or your fighters. And our final chonker here is the Legion. This bad boy has two variants, the regular and the 14th battle group variant. Most people, myself included, would consider the 14th battle group version to be superior since it comes with large missile mounts. A big reason why the large missiles are preferred is because the Legion, just like the Astral, wants as much range as possible. And since missiles have more range than anything the large ballistic slot can offer, the missile mounts are preferred. Missiles also don't use flux and the Legion wants as much of that as it can get. With either variant of the ship, you're probably going to run something like two high-velocity drivers and two heavy maulers to get as much range as possible from your ballistic slots. You can then fill the small slots with some PD, like Vulcans or light machine guns, and that would make up a good backbone for your build. To touch a little bit on hull mods you might add on to carriers, you'd be correct in assuming that any carriers with Medium or large missile slots are probably going to want ECCM. Expanded deck crew is always nice to improve the efficiency for fighters. And for the Legion and the Astral especially, integrated targeting is absolutely mandatory. Because of how slow these ships are, you're going to want as much range as possible. And taking advantage of that huge range boost capital ships get from this hull mod is essential. Now that we've touched a little bit on each carrier, let's dive into which fighters you'll want to equip on your carriers. Getting a sense of what each fighter does will also help you react to them in combat, since some enemies like to spam them. I'm looking at you, pirates. Fighters ultimately come in four categories, interceptors, bombers, fighters, and support wings. Since fighters are a subcategory of fighters, I'll refer to fighters collectively as small craft from here on out, and this term fighters will be used for the specific subcategory. Fortunately, each fighter category has a straightforward purpose. Interceptors engage other small craft. Fighters are generalists that can engage small craft as well as other ships. Support wings stick to their carrier and defend it against threats, and bombers go on ordnance runs where they drop their payload, return to the carrier to replenish, and then drop their payload again. To start, we'll take a look at the support wing. There are only two types of support wings, the Sarissa and the Xiphos. Both are very good and will risk life and limb to keep their carrier up and running. The Xiphos end up being stronger than the Sarissa, with them having an ion beam and a burst PD laser. However, the Sarissa is six ordnance points cheaper, so it's to be expected that the Xiphos would be more powerful. By far the most diverse class of small craft is the bomber category, since there are a variety of different things you can drop. I'd be happy to help you cut through all this diversity though and tell you about the one that matters most, the Longbow. The Longbow's main selling point is it drops one of the best missiles in the game, the Sabo. Sabo missiles are cherished among missile enjoyers because it not only does kinetic damage against shields, but it does EMP damage along with it. This can burn through a ship's flux and also lead to newly acquired disabilities for said ships. It doesn't stop there either. Longbows also have good speed, survivability, and a burst PD laser to boot. So if you have your wits about you, you should look to add longbows to your carriers when you can. As an alternative to the longbow, if you're looking for a bomber that can strip armor, I'd recommend the dagger. Daggers carry Atropos torpedoes that have a respectable tracking and good speed, and en masse, they can take down mid-sized ships with relative ease. The problem with other bombers, like the Cobra, Perdition, and Piranha, is that their payloads struggle to hit moving targets. Against bases and slow-moving capital ships, they'll do all right, but many of the most threatening enemies in Stark Sector are quick, so having a fighter slot taken up by one of these bombers instead of a longbow is ill-advised. Moving into the fighter category, we have some solid options. If we're being honest though, the broadsword is usually going to be the favorite since it balances strength and speed. Broadswords also have decoy flares that interfere with a ship's point defense. This kind of utility is perfectly suited for the broadsword since it doesn't have a ton of health, so it's going to want to distract the point defense on a ship. If you're willing to sacrifice some speed for more efficacy against armor, then my vote of confidence would be with the Warthog. With a couple wings of Warthogs, you can put even some cruisers to shame, since the non-stop mortars shred through armor quickly. As for the other small craft in this category, the Gladius is like a discounted broadsword. 
and the clause, cardinal sin, is that it does EMP damage. All the while, the best bomber in the game, the longbow, offers a more effective source of EMP damage that also burns through shields. So with the longbow being one of the more popular bombers, it's hard to justify the claw being used. Last up, we have interceptor wings. Talons are the discount option in this category at a very cheap two points per wing. Above them, you have wasps, which I'd say are worth the cost if you can replace the talons with them. Wasps may be fragile, but they don't require a pilot. They're very quick to replenish, so they do a great job of deterring enemy small craft. With the basics taken care of, let's get into building out this Heron here and then using it in combat because controls for carriers in combat are going to be a little bit different than what you're used to. For this build, I went ahead and built in expanded deck crew. That's always going to be useful for a carrier like this no matter uh, what kind of build I go for. I'm going for a balanced approach here so that we're effective against mid-size and small-size ships. The Thunders give me an option for smaller frigates that are faster. And then the Warthogs make sure I have some beefier fighters for mid-sized ships. And the Wasps I've added to screen for our Warthogs and our Thunders. I want the Wasps to help with missiles that might be tracking our other fighters, as well as distract a ship's point defense away from our more valuable Thunders and Warthogs. For weapons, I kept things pretty basic, just regular PD lasers in the small energy slots, and then I've gone for a hyper-velocity driver in the medium slot. Since the Heron is pretty quick, now I do have perks that have increased the top speed to 100. Normally you'd have the 80 uh, base speed. And with that base speed of 80, it'll be quite possible that we'll be in range to use a hypervelocity driver. The shield pressure provided by the hypervelocity driver makes up for the fact that we don't have broadswords or longbows with this build. We're going to want that anti-shield damage. Given that we have the hypervelocity driver, Integrated targeting unit is absolutely going to be something we want to use for that 40% range bonus for cruisers. Let's go ahead and hop into a simulation and see how we do. For our purposes, I think an Eagle is a good matchup. It's the same deployment cost as our ship. So even though it's a cruiser, it's a chunkier ship, we do have Warthogs. So we should fare quite well. All right, hopping into things here, you'll see that there is a orders regroup section in the menu on the bottom left. When you are piloting a carrier, you'll get to choose whether your fighters are going to regroup or they're going to attack a certain target. Regrouping is important for when your fighter count starts to dwindle and you'll want to replenish before sending them out again. As you replenish more and more fighters, it's important to note that your replacement rate, which is shown down here on the bottom left too, that's going to decrease as the fight goes on. As we roll up this eagle, we can see it has a good bit of uh, beam, beam damage. It also has burst PD lasers and some regular PD lasers in the back. This means our fighters might have a tough time. However, my hope is that with the wasps mixed in, this eagle's PD is going to be overwhelmed. And we'll be able to use our hypervelocity driver to chip away at its shield until it eventually can take some armor and hull damage. Let's keep the pressure up. Our fighters are still up. They are putting in work. The eagle has been focused on me mainly. And as we can see here, even though my piloting has not been, has not been great, you see the armor on the back of this eagle is burnt. And as it's trying to ration out its flux to shoot me, it has not been able to take out these fighters. And before I forget, one thing that's cool about the Heron is it has a targeting feed ability. That is going to increase the damage our fighters do. And we'll see here, I'm going to hit F. And they're just going to do a whole lot of damage. And this is where you, you may have been in this situation. This is where ships run into trouble. Because let's say they have, let's say they're squaring up against even a smaller ship. And they have fighters on them at the same time. Flux management and maneuvering becomes much more difficult. Because when you're under fighter, 
when you're under fire from fighters, you're going to have these random places on your ship that no longer have any armor. And it's our warthogs that are doing that. Okay, needler down. Venting. And our, it looks like our fighters are just... They're going to finish the job. And there you go. I just showcased how effective fighters can be. But I do want to warn you. There are going to be certain ships, particularly larger ships, that have a lot of point defense. And sending your fighters after them is going to be ill-advised. Let's say... Now we're getting into a heavier ship. Capital ship. Let's say we sent... Let's say we send in these two carriers. This, so this is six fighter slots. Same amount of slots that you have on an Astral. If we match these up, and I'll let the AI do its thing. If we match these up against something like this. To our, our poor, poor, and our poor, poor fighters. You look at that, we have four Vulcans. Four flat cannons, a dual flat cannon, and it's got a bunch of other stuff, a bunch of other nasty stuff. So it's not going to be able to catch our Heron. It's not going to be able to even catch our Mora. But let's see what happens. Look at that. Our fighters have been de look at that. Our fighters have been decimated. The wasps are already been reduced down. We've lost a warthog, and I'd venture to guess our Mora. Our Morris fighters are not in great shape, too. Let's play this out a little bit further to see what happens. Let's speed it up. My word. My word. My word. Those Devastator cannons do not mess around. Our fighters have hardly touched it. Its armor is still intact. It's had to vent once. But that's it. Just look at it. And our missiles aren't really getting through. The wasps seem to just be getting one tapped by those devastator cannons. And yeah, so what you have here in the onslaught is just a ship that's very good against fighters. So whenever you're using fighters, you're not gonna want to send them after ships that have a lot of point defense. But you'll have heavy losses and the fighters will not be able to do their job effectively. In terms of fleet composition with carriers, you could take a few different approaches. One approach is to carrier spam. And that's, that's a valid strategy, it certainly can work. With carrier spam, you'll want something on the front line that can take a fair amount of heat, and then behind that, as many carriers as you can manage. For carrier spam, you'll want to use drovers, because drovers have that B-deck ability that helps them pump out fighters at an increased rate. If you don't want to use Drovers, it would also be valid to stock up on as many Mora or as many Herons as you can stomach. The reason why you wouldn't use the Astral or the Legion for carrier spam is because pound for pound with their deployment point cost, they actually don't provide you as many fighter bays per deployment point compared to the smaller carriers. For instance, with the Astral, and this is one of the things that bothers me about the Astral, is it's 50 deployment points and you're getting six fighter bays. That's around eight deployment points per fighter bay compared to pretty much all the other carriers. That's inefficient. If you want more fighters, you would go with smaller ships. The Legion has the same problem with that though. The Legion has four fighter bays and its deployment point cost is 40. So you're looking at 10 deployment points per fighter bay. I know that almost pushes the Legion into the hybrid category instead of the pro being a carrier, but the Legion has more firepower than the Astral to make up for that. If you're going for a more balanced fleet composition, then that's when you would look to add an Astral or a Legion maybe, because then fighters aren't your primary way of dealing damage. They're just a supplement. So you could run something like, I honestly, a paragon with an astral behind it that works just fine or you could run an onslaught with a legion behind it that works too the main thing you're going to want to take care of with carriers is having something in front of them that is has either a lot of shields or a lot of armor because carriers themselves do not have much in terms of defense and this is a glaring problem with the astral because as we kind of talked about earlier the mora is tougher than an astral and the legion is definitely tougher than an astral 
Meanwhile, the Astral is very slow. So it's gonna lag behind your fleet, making it very vulnerable to any kind of flanking that's going on. The Legion, on the other hand, doesn't have to worry as much about that because it has more firepower for one, and for two, it has this tremendous amount of armor where even if it's overfluxed, it can tank a lot of damage. In a sense, this solves one of the main problems that carriers have, getting outflanked. Into the Legion's credit, into the Moor's credit, having a lot of armor buys time. That is time for you to reinforce them, get someone in there to help. That is time for their fighters to replenish. Time is very important for carriers. One of the big hurdles I faced when using carriers is when you start to get in the later stages of the game, you're fighting remnants and you're fighting high value bounties, the larger, the capital ships tear through your fighters. And then what are you left with? Big problem with the Astral. Once the enemy goes through the Astral's fighters, the Astral has hardly anything left. It has some PD, it is some beam damage, but that's that's not enough. That is not enough for a capital ship, in my opinion. And for it to have a 50 deployment point cost and have less firepower than the Legion, in my opinion, that's I, I think I think that's unacceptable. And I'm gonna cut myself off there. Did not mean for this video to turn into an astral bashing session, but but for real people, if you want a lot of fighters in your fleet, you could use the drover, like I mentioned before, or just use Condors or Mark III Colossus. But you can get fighters for around four deployment points, five deployment points per fighter bay, and then still have enough points left over to invest in a decent front line. Anyway, that's all I have to say for now. If you enjoyed this video, comment below with what your favorite carrier is. Which ones do you like to use? Do you spam them out? Do you just have a handful? Let me know. Love to hear about it. And I'll see you in the next one.